the time that they wanted to get him on to chat show time and time again, they obviously knew what he was like and that there was a risk. But risk also brought with it good television. If it went well, then it could be electric. Television would put him, for example, in a green room for far too long. If you put him with some lesbians and some radicalists and ask him what he thinks about feminism, well, you almost know the response you're going to get. And so they knew what they were doing. They quite often sort of lined him up was it for the fall. Was it ever difficult to watch that fall? Yes. If you think of how he made his name, it was scowling and being moody and being slightly controversial about women and their place on the kitchen. And that was antagonistic. So the, the likes of Jermaine Greer instantly picked up on that. And he had great television. It was crackling. It was alive. So he knew what he was do doing in terms of that. Um, but in reality, was he really like that? No. My sense of him was that he wasn't as chauvinist as he could appear. Towards the end, I think when you look at the After Dark or whatever it was called and the, the one that he did where they were shooting in the, in the dressing room. The word, yeah. the word. I found that a little bit cruel almost. It was a little bit about exploitation. It was a little bit about prodding a slightly lame animal. He was too good and he was too clever and he was too bright and often he was too pissed um, to be doing those shows. It was sad to see someone being treated in such a way. It was slightly sort of cynical. There was a very different side to him, um, which was much more gentle, which was much more thoughtful, much more sensitive than the Ollie Reed that we all read about and all heard about. Very different person. Early days here at Broomhall. Yeah. You see it's all very overgrown. So this would have been very soon after he'd Yeah, the early, very early 70s. When we first came here, it was overgrown, there were broken windows, the house was in a terrible state. And uh, he set to work um, with lots of people, uh, putting it back to how it should be. We lived here from when I was about 10 till I was about 20. So that's sort of 71 to 81. 71 to 81, very happy memories. It was a great adventure playground for young and old alike. In the middle of the night, we used to uh, go out uh, with boot black on our faces and play soldiers. And on my father's bedroom, outside the window, there used to be a searchlight. And so you could be scurrying around in the fields and suddenly the searchlight would start panning across the fields. And you'd be hiding behind shy horses or hiding in the trees and the bushes. And that's Ollie by the lake? Down by the lake. It's a magnificent photograph. And so the lake was huge. I mean, they, they, they've... Nine acres, it's been drained subsequent to that. Yeah. It's actually smaller than it, it used to be. I mean, we would go and suddenly he would decide that he wanted to put a chandelier on one of the trees on the lake. And so at two in the morning, in midwinter, people would go down and you'd try and row a boat across the ice, <laughs> which, as you can imagine, breaking the ice yeah. as it went, just to put a, a chandelier on a tree and then come back to the house and admire the chandelier from the house. And that was midwinter, how people just did not die in, this, in the lake or around the grounds, freezing cold, exposure, I just never know. And were there hangovers? Of course, of course. You haven't had a good beer unless you've had a good hangover. He would work hard and play hard, so when he was working he was very professional and I think if you talk to anyone who knew him or worked with him, they would always tell you that he was ready on time, he knew his lines, he had hit his marks, he knew exactly what he was up to. But when it was playtime, off he went to play. And he loved playing. So this is almost exactly where we're standing, is it? Almost exactly yeah. where we are. To see. Very similar. The greenery and the trees and the space were magical to him, very important. So the outside was as important to him in many ways as indeed the house itself and the inside. It was Ollie with spade. Ollie with spade. Actually getting his hands it did dirty. happen. Yeah. My father was often out here digging. I've got photographs of him, sort of digging the flower beds, redigging the flower beds, from sort of bringing it back from the wilds. Um, massive, massive investment in everything. One of the sequences that we describe in the play is Keith Moon arriving by helicopter yeah. when they're making Tommy. And where where was it that the helicopter landed? Then? On this very on this very lawn here, which was a field. It's all a bit posher than it was then but landed in this, in this paddock um, and up to the house and into the kitchen. I remember Keith arriving 
in those days was a tiny little video recorder, little camera. And no one had those sorts of things in those days, quite wizardrous. Yeah, he loved Keith. And they did have something quite unique. I mean, there was a remarkable chemistry there. There were other people that sort of touched him as well. There were people like Lee Marvin. Um, and I remember spending a, a holiday, a school holiday, with my father um, out in Mexico whilst he was making a film with Marvin. We were all sitting in this Winnebago when there was a knock on the door and Mr. Marvin was wanted on the set again. And as he got up to leave to go back to the set, uh, he looked round, he saw me lying at the end of the Winnebago on this bed with a pair of my father's cowboy boots standing up. And he turned to my father and he said, Oliver, he said, you never leave your boots standing up in the West. And with that, I sort of leant over and puked straight into these, into these boots. <laughs> Is that he, why you and he said, I told you so. <laughs> and he walked out and he went off on to set. Lee was just a good man. The next day he came up and he put, I was 15, put his arm around me and said, like, how are you? How are you feeling? And it was like, not too good. But just a good, honest, real man. And I think that, again, would have been what my father identified with. It was the reality of the man. It was the trueness of him. I'm obviously very aware of the fact that some people may think, you know, you've got a bob on yourself. Who do you think you are kind of coming on as Oliver Reed when you see these pictures of him and you see the magnetism that he had as a performer in some of these photographs? Yes. And I think it's really important that, um, that we're not pretending that I am him or that I am an actor of his stature. And I, I mean, I sort of hope that came across in the... There's only one Ollie Reed. Absolutely. Yeah. And whoever it was, if it was Olivia, it would never be Oliver Reed. Mm. Um, and that was probably when I came and saw the show. That was probably one of the first things that I had to come to terms with, was that it was someone saying the things that he would have said, doing the things that he would have done, re recounting a history of, of his life. Um, and it wasn't him, and it would never be him. But that's, that said, I think you did a remarkably good job. And I think that it was very well written, and that it really captured the, the essence of the man. He was always looking for excitement. And the Cricketers was a place with a lovely ingle nook fireplace and he used to climb up that and uh, lean against the side of the chimney with a lit fire with smoke and heat and th he'd stay up there for 20 minutes and then drop down by which time there'd been a, a new uh, group of customers who'd come into the pub he thought that was great fun he thought that that was electric it brought life into something contradiction probably in some ways sums him up in, on one side there was the, the very it's almost like knowing the rules in order to be able to break them good elocution um, and good table manners and all of those things were instilled into me since I was that big. Um, and yet I saw him sometimes do terrible things at the table. But you had to know all the rules in order to be able to break them. But the lovely thing is that in all the mischief that went on, there was never really any malice. It was much more about having fun, being naughty, pushing it a little bit further. It wasn't about being vicious, it wasn't about hurting people. It was about having fun, seeing how far you could go, being naughty. To him, life was a playground, and he didn't take it too seriously. And it was at its best when it was spontaneous, when people were laughing, when there was emotion that was flowing. Mm -hmm. 